Welcome back to the DNA Papers, a podcast series which unpacks the history of the seminal findings through which we found out about the DNA molecule and its role in life and heredity. I'm Nirja Sankaran, a historian of biology and medicine, who will be anchoring the series through its dozen or so episodes. In our first two installments, we introduced the work of a few physiological chemists in Germany in the late 19th century who discovered the material that we now call DNA, but initially labeled as nuclein because of its localization in the nucleus of the cell, and described its chemical components or its building blocks. Beginning today, and in the next few episodes, we wander farther afield to different countries, other sometimes unexpected scientific disciplines, and to new experimental animals and plants. In today's episode, for instance, we cross the oceans and half a continent from Europe to go to the prairies of Kansas in the American Midwest, where Walter Sutton, a young graduate student in zoology, studied the cells of grasshoppers and published two papers in 1902 and 1903. The first was titled On the Morphology of the Chromosome Group in Brachistola Magna. Brachistola is the zoological name for grasshoppers. And the second paper, The Chromosomes in Heredity. Now, unlike the papers from our previous episode, Sutton's contributions are by no means obscure. Any student of elementary genetics learns about what is called the sutton bowery theory of chromosomes as a matter of course. But since neither of Sutton's papers makes any mention of DNA, which was not yet an acronym in 1903 or 2, or nuclein, or for that matter, any of the nucleic acids at all, one might wonder why they are in a lineup of papers that I submit are must-reads in a history of DNA. And the reasons, which will be explicated by our distinguished guests today, lie in the fact that these papers were the first crucial step in tying together a tangible cellular structure, the chromosomes from the title of the papers, with ideas about heredity, as well as about the chemical workings of living cells. Our guests today bring a variety of insights and perspectives to this story, and so I'll lose no more time in introducing them to you. In alphabetical order by last name, they are Matthew Cobb, who got a PhD in psychology but then went on to study fruit flies, Drosophila, the model organisms for laying the foundations of genetics. He's the author of several original works of history of science, including in 2015, Life's Greatest Secret, The Race to Crack the Genetic Code, which makes him the ideal person to participate in a conversation on why a pair of early 20th century papers on insect chromosomes belong in a podcast series about DNA. Welcome, Matthew. Our next panelist, Durga Das Kasbeker, is a geneticist who studies, hands-on in the lab, the chromosomes of fungi and amoebae, creatures that most people outside of science do not normally think about, at least not deliberately. Since 2012, he has held the first Haldane chair at the Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics in Hyderabad, India. Durga brings a working scientist's perspective to the history of his field, and I'm very pleased that he agreed to join us today. Welcome, Durga. Thank you. Regular listeners of the podcasts at the Consortium will need no introduction to our next guest, historian of science Vasiliki Betty Smokovitis from the University of Florida, an expert in the history of evolution, plant biology, and also in scientific biography. She is the incoming president in 2023 of the society we fondly call Ishka Bibel, which is the International Society for the History, Philosophy, and Social Studies of Biology. She's also, as we just found out and are pleased to get the scoop on announcing, the incoming co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of History of Biology. Thank you, Betty for taking time out of what surely must be a very hectic schedule to participate in today's session. Thanks so much. So welcome again, everybody. And I'm going to jump right in to asking you to explain what these papers are about. Please distill the contents for our audience. 
Durga, as someone who gets your hands dirty with chromosomes on a daily basis, would you care to go first? Sure. Thank you, Neeraja. So the Sutton papers reported five findings based on his work with the grasshoppers, Brachistola magma. And three of these findings that he reported were based on his observations and two were really inferences that he made both based on the observations and his understanding at the time of Mendel's work. The first was that every time a cell divided, the chromatin in its nucleus resolved itself into several pairs of chromosomes. The second finding, the number of chromosome pairs was constant for the species. The third, the two members of each pair of chromosomes were of the same size and each pair maintained its size relation relative to the other chromosome pairs larger and smaller than itself. The fourth was a conjecture that one member of each pair of chromosomes was inherited from the father and the other from the mother. And the fifth, that during germ cell production, the members of each pair were passed into the germ cells independently of each other and regardless of whether it was derived from the father or the mother. This last conjecture actually wasn't made in the first paper, the 1902 paper, but it was explicated in the 1903 paper, I think he had time to think about, about this matter and uh, he goes to great lengths to show how uh, this shuffling can increase the number of combinations consistent with what Mendel found. So uh, that in a nutshell is the main scientific conclusions one can draw from the, these papers. Thank you. Matthew, Betty, would you like to add anything? Well, I think one of the things we need to think about is when Sutton began this, what was his intention? What was his aim? If we put ourselves back into the mind of this student, the turn of the century, just as Mendel's work is being rediscovered, what does he think he's actually trying to do here? Because on one level, this is a description of these mysterious structures called the chromosomes, which are very different when you look at them down the microscope or you try and draw them as he does in his papers compared to the figures you see in many modern papers where you can clearly see chromosomes as long, thin strands with lots of banding on them. I think it's worth just thinking for a minute about why are they call chromosomes anyway. What does that, that mean? Well, it means the coloured body. And one of the reasons why they were coloured was that they would take up stains very very easily so you could identify them under the microscope and clearly by looking at cells at living cells and cells at different stages of division they were significant in some way these structures but what they were doing wasn't very clear so what he started out to do is simply to describe what he can see as Durga has explained in terms of this division this resolution into two pairs into sets of pairs and even this resolution is quite mysterious because normally when you look at a cell, you can't see much. And then depending on its state in the cell cycle, this can become resolved as the, as the matter that the chromosomes are made of condenses and forms different structures. And I think perhaps one, although for us now, the most interesting thing about this is how he fits it into Mendel's laws. What would he have done if Mendel's work hadn't been rediscovered in 1900, but in 1905, what would he have thought he was seeing? Would he have thought this was a structural component, simply something to do with the, the organisation of the cell? Would he have imagined it's something to do with development or heredity? Or maybe he might have made predictions about what you would expect to see in terms of patterns of inheritance. I, I know historians don't generally like counterfactuals, but sometimes they're useful. I don't know what Betty thinks about that. Well, you just basically said what I was going to start saying. Oh, sorry. I don't like counterfactuals. I think it. I think we would. We probably wouldn't be here discussing Sutton in quite the same way if it had been 1905, because someone else would have scooped him on it. And we know very much that you know Bovary was independently thinking of a lot of the same ideas. But to get back to the original question, the way I think of Sutton, and he's always in the narrative, 
is that this is the moment when the rubber hits the road. This is when we get you know, data and knowledge about the material carriers of heredity. You know, we know where they are. And that's really the big picture of why these two papers matter. Now, as a historian of science, I'm really intrigued by the fact that there are two papers. And the first one is mostly based on observation. There's a lot of data. There's illustrations that incidentally are stunning. You know, he's got such a great skill set. He's able to draw these things and to understand chromosomes deeply. And it's very hard to do that at the turn of the century. Let's appreciate that. And then the second paper is more of a rethinking of the data that he's generating in the first paper, because then he's actually read Mendel. And he's read Mendel because he's actually reading Bateson. So if you look at the footnotes to the second paper, you'll see how there's a direct reference to Mendel. And, you know, right in that first couple of paragraphs where he's actually rethinking what he saw and adding kind of kind of embellishing. But it's the more general paper of the two. And I think the generality is embodied in the title, The Chromosomes in Heredity, which is, you know, it's big, it's ambitious as a title. And incidentally, I was also intrigued by the fact that when Thomas Hunt Morgan publishes his kind of sweeping generalization in 1910, it's a very similar kind of a title. So you really have to read these two papers together. And and again, as a historian of science, I'm intrigued by the way they fit together. Without wishing to push the analogy too far, in the series we're going to see later on the difference between Watson and Crick's two papers in 1953, the first one which has got the model of DNA in it, and the second one which is actually describing and exploring the function and thinking in a much more abstract and generalised way about what the implications are for that. Now, I'm not suggesting in any way that Watson and Crick had any... I mean, they probably never read something. That would be... Maybe Watson did, but I'm sure Crick didn't. But this would have... I think this similarity between here's the great breakthrough, now I can... But then actually spending time thinking about it, mulling it over, what are the functional implications of what I have discovered? And I think that's quite interesting, that that difference between the, the more data-driven and then the more conceptual one, which makes any students reading that the more conceptual one much easier because they don't know much about chromosomes in general and even less about grasshopper chromosomes. So the it's the ideas, I think, which many less experienced and less specialist readers will find more exciting. Can I also add, I think also for the student of um, not just the history of science, but of science, it's a nice demonstration of the way that science is done. You, You don't necessarily know the big picture. You don't have a sense of the big picture when you're generating, when you're making the observations or generating the data. And you're then adding, embellishing, maybe tweaking in some respects. So it's really, you know, it's I don't think it's an accident. I don't think there's a causal link, as you said, between the two instances, but I do think it indicative of the way that science is done and presented. Yeah, I'd also like to add that he was lucky that the cells of the, of the germline, the spermatogonial cells of the grasshopper were so large and could be easily followed through their divisions. That's because he could follow the chromosomes through multiple rounds of divisions before they made the germ cells, before they made the sperm. And he could also look at the germline to a limited extent in the female. Had the cells of the germline not been so large and had they been simply the cells, uh, some somatic cells, then I think it might have been difficult for him to generalize from studies on the somatic cells that these pairs of chromosomes play a role in inheritance it's because he saw it in the germline he could make that leap so i think that's that's a a nice thing that it played out this way because not all germlines are so amenable for microscopic observation so that i thought is an interesting stroke of luck well i'm not sure it's luck i want to add and i and you know in the history and philosophy and sociology of science there is a very rich literature 
on the choice of model organism. And this is a little bit of an anachronism because, you know, model organism is a term that comes out of biomedical science in all about the 1970s or 1980s, but your choice of organismic system, let's say. And, and as I reflect on Sutton, what makes him truly astonishing and amazing is the fact that he's choosing to work with a system, the lubber chromosome of the grasshopper. And, and as you say, the testes have very large chromosomes that are easy to follow, and you've got to be able to see them. And that's part of the one of the biggest reasons that he's able to see what he does see. You know, the human chromosome story doesn't break until the late 1950s because the chromosomes are so small and there's so many of them. So I think that part of the the actual system that he chooses to work on. Now, it's not luck because he goes to Clarence McClung, his advisor at the University of Kansas as a sophomore, who is creating an entire school of grasshopper genetics. And, you know, in the history of genetics, we're always talking about fruit flies and maize, corn. We're talking about mice. And yet here's McClung, one of the great underappreciated figures in the history of genetics who at the turn of the century, this is before the fruit fly work is done or, or begins, and he's working on grasshoppers. And that's because, you know, Kansas... Kansas provides him with abundant <laughs> examples and different kinds of grasshoppers. And they're economically important. That's the other thing, because Kansas had seen the great grasshopper plague of 1874. So, so it's, it's a mixing of things that come together that, that enable Sutton to come up with these stunning observations, literally while he was still a graduate student. Yeah, I think what I meant by luck was that it's lucky that the grasshoppers have such large cells and large chromosomes in the germline that goes on to make the sperm. I understand that turning to grasshoppers wasn't luck, but grasshoppers having a germline that allowed him to make observations on chromosomes and get their relative sizes. In fact, in the first paper, the 2000, uh, 1902 paper, he actually lists the sizes that he has measured, including of the spherines, the lengths. And these are actual measurements. He knows the limitations of uh, making uh, measurements based on camera lucida drawings. But yet he knows that the consistency will come through and he collects data to make his point. So that the chromosomes were large enough for him to make measurements on drawings and the measurements are consistent uh, with his conclusion. I think there is an element of luck because his observations on the female germline were not really all that many and they were, in fact, a little incorrect. He thought the females had 22 chromosomes, whereas they have 24. So it was a bit lucky in that sense. I agree with uh, the rest of what Betty said, that the context in which he did this work, of course, there was, it wasn't entirely lucky. Yeah. Thank you for this fascinating discussion. I want to turn next to why these papers are useful, even essential, in learning about the history of the DNA molecule. And if there are any passages in the papers that you feel are particularly worth highlighting when thinking about them in this context. Matthew, would you like to go first? I think, in a way, it's, they're so important because they don't directly tell us anything about the history of DNA at all. DNA or nuclein uh, isn't mentioned, although there is a discussion of what later became known as nuclear proteins. So this mixture of DNA and protein, which is what chromosomes are, are made of. But I think what it's useful is for concentrating our mind and thinking about how, without knowing what exactly a gene was, or if it was a physical thing at all, because this was still a, a hypothesis, that you could nonetheless identify there is a link, apparent link, between the chromosomes and various hereditary characters. And you could see, or you could propose, you could imagine how that might occur. And I think one of the most striking uh, things in the second paper is this remarkable table, table one, in which he works out the, the possible combinations 
of different numbers of chromosomes. If you've got 36 chromosomes, so 18 pairs, you have a potential number in terms of combinations of those 18 pairs, 66 billion, uh, 68 billion. Obviously, I'm not going to give you all the numbers. They're on the paper. So, and then this isn't, this isn't any biology. This is just maths. This is simply working out the combinatorial options. Now, I think that shows the richness, the potential complexity there is inside the genetic system, because one of the problems that we all have is an understanding, well, how on earth can you get uh, the full complexity of an individual, be it a pea plant or a locust or a human being, out of this tiny little structure? And the, this gives us some insight into the complexity that might be there. And he even goes on later on, I think, again, this is quite remarkable, to highlight that it's possible that the same chromosome can contain, may contain both recessive and dominant characters. So he's already started to think that, in fact, these chromosomes aren't simply, he doesn't write this way and couldn't think this way, but they're not representing the head or the legs or whatever. Each chromosome isn't corresponding to a particular body part, but rather it contains within it a whole series of elements that may be present in dominant or recessive characters, which is obviously taken from Bateson and from the, the rediscovery of, of Mendel's work, as Betty was explaining earlier on. So we've got this attempt at the very beginning of this link between the facts of genetics and of the patterns of heredity with these cellular structures which are behaving in the way you would expect were they to be the carriers of heredity. This is yet to be fully demonstrated, but they're behaving in that way. But then when it comes to thinking what's actually, what are they actually made of? How is the material basis of that uh, represented? Well, that's a completely different ball game, and it's much more difficult than a modern student imagines, well, it's all DNA and it's a ACTG or, or whatever. Without knowing any of that, you've got to try and grapple with really quite difficult concepts. And I think he does that in the second paper quite remarkably. In particular, for given how, how, how young he is, <laughs> it's always what I think about these people from the turn of the century and from the early years is that they're all incredibly young and they're doing this astonishing work. Thank you. May I ask you to quote a passage that demonstrates any of this? Could you cue it by page and paper? I haven't got the original version. I've got a reprint of it. So it's halfway through. <laughs> I can't give you a, a page in the original version, but it's about halfway through. And he says, Bateson calls attention to the light which will be thrown on the phenomenon of the combinations of characters. If, if we ventured to assume that the bases of the two allelomorphs concerned, the different characters you can see, are chemical compounds. And so he's venturing to assume this. He's not, it's not, it's, it's quite bold claim he's making. If we imagine that they are uh, chemical compounds, then we can begin to understand, suggests Bateson. He compares the behavior of the allelomorphs that he'd isolated to the reaction of sodium and chlorine in the formation of salt. So he's got this idea they have the same function or similar functions, but different the results of chemical analysis show that one of the most characteristic features of chromatin, that's the material of chromosomes, is a large percentage content of highly complex and variable chemical compounds, the nucleoproteins. So that's what later became called nucleoproteins. And therefore, if as assumed in the theory here advanced, the chromosomes are the bases of definite hereditary characters, the suggestion of Bateson becomes more than a merely interesting comparison. Nice piece of uh, understatement at the end. Great. Thank you. Would uh, Betty or Durga like to add anything, please? Or choose a different passage to quote as well? No, I'd let Betty go ahead on this. Well, I was going to say something kind of um, coming at this obliquely about why does this paper belong in the DNA paper story. Let me refer people to a very, I think a very influential collection of 1959 by, edited by James Peters called Classic Papers in Genetics. And if you look at it, the third paper that's listed is Sutton, Sutton's paper, and the collection builds and goes into the 1953 paper by Watson and Crick. So if you look at this collection that's actually written 
that's uh, compiled in 1959. These are the original papers. You can see how nicely the story unfolds. That what Matthew just described, there is a section at the end of the first paper, of course, that is evocative. I have to say, it's like, you know, you're you're reading it and you're going, it's like reading that famous line in the 1953 DNA paper, you know, about the suggestion, this this massive overstatement and reading it, that's that's when I get I call it the goosebump moment as a historian of science, where you're you're quite literally you're you're chilled because you realize the ending of that first paper presages literally the importance of the second paper. And it's a it, and it's a kind of an an understatement. Does somebody have the copy right in front to read it out? Yes, I do. I was going to do so. What he says is, I may finally call attention to the probability that the association of paternal and maternal chromosomes in pairs and their subsequent separation during the reducing division, as indicated above, may constitute the physical basis of Mendelian law of heredity. To this subject, I hope soon to return in another place. And the other place, of course, I assume is the second paper. The second paper. Yeah, and you know, it's an understatement, but there you have it. The physical basis of Mendelian heredity. The rubber hitting the road, the material carriers of heredity, right at the end of the paper, after he's done all of that observational work and all of the care that he shows. But that to me is, you know, it's it's quite literally the, the great moment in this early history of genetics, because it's, you know, he comes, he approaches it with this modest tone, you know, it probability and suggestion, let me draw attention to this. So that's my favorite part of the two papers. Although you can't help thinking that uh, if this were to be in 2023 and he'd sent this into nature, they would have trashed it saying, you've got no mechanism, you've got no proof, go away. <laughs> could, could I also add something, again, a little bit filling in the context as a historian of science? He publishes this these two papers in a place called the Biological Bulletin of the Marine Biological Laboratory. And I think that's a really interesting fact that we can explore because it's not a journal of genetics. It's not nature. It is not science, Matthew. It is in this journal that comes from the Marine Biological Laboratory, which is one of the great U.S.-based institutions. And to contextualize Sutton a little bit, the U.S. was just really emerging as a place to do science. And the MBL at Woods Hole was one of the great locations. If you look at the masthead, you've got names like Conklin, Loeb, Thomas Hunt Morgan, right? You've got William Mort Wheeler, Charles Otis Whitman, and his advisor, E.B. Wilson. So it's not an accident that he's publishing in that particular venue. And remember, there just weren't that many journals out there because genetics, I mean, the, the word is not even coined until it's coined by Bateson. I think it's 1905. So he's publishing where his advisors are literally publishing and where he has influence. So that's why it's not nature. It's a lot longer than nature would uh, would accept. Yeah. I, I think... The uh, younger listeners need to realise as well, of course, there's no peer review at this time. It's a completely kind of post-war invention or 1960s or 70s invention, in fact. So this will have just been submitted to the editor who will have gone, yes, that's great, especially, yes, I know your supervisor, and then, bang, it gets published. But, I mean, I'd reiterate Betty's point about the biological bulletin. As a, as a student in the 1970s, so many of the papers that I was interested in were from the 1940s and before were published in the Biological Bulletin. I mean, it was an extremely important journal. Durga, do you have anything to add at this stage? Uh, yeah, just a tangential reference, because I think when Betty said the goosebump moment, it's, I think she's referring to the conclusion of the Watson and Crick 1953 paper. And the fact that 1953 was exactly 50 years after 1903 
I uh, wouldn't be surprised if Watson or Crick or both of them or someone who they confided in told them that some of these ideas were may ever put forth by Sutton. Maybe you should look at his paper and then reading through, they might, must have come across this concluding paragraph and might have been influenced by it in drafting their own. I think it might have been uh, an opportunity missed if no historian of science ever asked Watson or Crick whether that passage from Sutton influenced their writing because it's 50 years later. That's a very interesting point. Yeah, I, I, my guess would be no. Certainly not Crick who wrote that phrase and wrote it as a, as he said, it's, uh, it's simply a statement of priority. And that's why it's so condensed because they knew they were going to think about how, it's only about replication, of course. It doesn't refer to anything else DNA might do. Watson may well have read it. I mean, I'm sure he will have done, in fact, when he was at Chicago. This would have been one of the papers that he, he will have read as a, an undergrad. I'll ask Nathaniel Comfort, who's writing a biography of Watson at the moment, just like I'm writing a biography of Crick, and we're in parallel. So I'll, I'll ask him, and maybe he can, if he hasn't thought about it, he'll go rummaging around. And can ask Jim, coherent answer. I'd like, actually, to back up in time a little bit and turn to Betty again to ask, and the others, could you give us some idea about Sutton's background? What was the general state of knowledge about cells and chromosomes at the time he produced his results? And how did this graduate student stumble on an observation of such magnitude? And why did he never produce anything again? I would say, I don't think he's stumbling. I think he's working very hard. It's part of the labor that gets erased very often in the history of science. Let me just go into giving you the kind of big picture of not just the rubber hitting the road, but as a historian who's actually suffered a lot about, about the history of cytogenetics and my work on Ledyard Stebbins, this is quite literally the beginnings of what comes to be called cytogenetics. Because what you had was cytology, that was, of course, very, very well developed. And then you had various kinds of aspects, let's say, of heredity, because it's not really genetics as we know it yet. And what he does is to bring the two together and to begin, it's literally the foundational paper in what becomes the science of cytogenetics. And then, of course, it just you know continues well into about the 1960s. And it's been resurrected now you know, people are now asking me all about polyploidy. They forgot everything that happened in the 1930s and the 1940s. But to come back to why I don't think he's stumbling and who is he? What is his background? How is he, how does he come on to do this work? And just to give you a, just a little bit of a biographical sketch, if I had to describe him very, very quickly, I would say he's your apple pie, American. I can't imagine anybody who would fit all the criteria of, you know, wholesomeness. Born in New York, the fifth son of seven sons. Dad's a lawyer. They move to Kansas and he grows up on a ranch where they're breeding livestock. And, you know, this this background in livestock breeding, that's you see that a lot in the history of genetics. Farm kids either plants or it could be chickens, it could be cattle, it could be any of these kinds of things. He comes up in this in this farm background near Russell, Kansas, and he distinguishes himself in the mechanical arts. He loves repairing farm equipment. He invents a camera. He's a gadgeteer. He's not stumbling on this, believe me, because he has the kind of skill set at a very, very early age, the dexterity the ability to manipulate, to create instruments. And at the same time, he's got the brain power. You know, he's, he's bringing things together in a way. I hate, to, I hate to use the word like genius, you know, as a historian of science, but here's somebody who comes pretty close to that in both being able to blend the hands, that kind of ma manual work with the brain the need, the understanding, the kind of theoretical, the deep understanding of cytology that he needs in order to write that, that first paper. But his passion is engineering. And what happens is he enrolls at the University of Kansas in engineering. And then his family gets sick of typhoid fever. He loses a brother. He takes care of him and his family pressures him and says to him, you know, you've got talent. 
in medicine. So he redirects his energy to biology, and that's how he finds Clarence McClung, who sets him on the project with grasshoppers. He's the one who chooses to work on Brachistola magna. He's choosing that particular system. So, you know, it's not stumbling. He's working at it. That's part of the labor of doing, doing the science. So he finishes his master's degree. McClung says to him, you know, you need to go somewhere else. You need to go work with the, the mighty Wilson, who's the cytologist at Columbia. And in a very short amount of time, like in a year, he produces the first paper and then he produces the second paper while he's with Wilson. He intends to finish his PhD, but he runs out of money and he returns to Kansas to work on the oil fields, which takes him away from his studies. And, you know, he's doing all these things, inventing, like working on oil drills and really the passion of an engineer mixed with a medical doctor. It's kind of, you know, what you get with him. But he returns to Columbia, gets his degree in medicine, invents all kinds of fascinating instruments, you know, using, injecting anesthetic through the rectum, fluoroscopy, using fluoroscopy to image the broken bodies, the shattered bodies of soldiers in the First World War. He's part of this ambulance team, kind of evocative. I kept thinking of Marie Curie and some of the work that she was doing in the First World War. And he returns, he returns to Kansas. He's got his medical degree from Columbia. He practices surgery. He's a gifted surgeon and he does all kinds of pioneering work in plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery, using the camera to record these novel procedures. He's really interested in appendicitis, which was a killer disease. People died of ruptured appendices all the time. And he's collecting, he's doing this work on appendicitis when he actually gets uh, he, his own appendix ruptures and there's nothing that can be done for him and he dies at the age of 39. It's just tragic that, you know, he's got this abbreviated but absolutely stellar, stellar career. So to come back to this kind of picture of him, how do I see him as this apple pie? He's he's really the Midwest, the heartland. Oh, by the way, he's a he's an athlete. He's playing on this basketball, varsity basketball team with the pioneer of basketball by the name of Nesmith. He's this, if you look at the pictures of him, he's this dashing figure, a little bit portly, perhaps. But, you know, he looks kind of like a, an A-grade movie star, like an Errol Flynn character, and especially this portrait of him in the white suit leaning against the tree. It's just so different from his predecessors. You know, you go along, when you look at that early history of genetics, you get all these Central European and German names, and along comes this wholesome basketball playing, very pragmatic, and at the same time, very theoretical. He's both individual. So in a nutshell, that's kind of who he is. So I do not think he stumbles onto anything. I think he's really working very hard at it. There's a lesson to me and to everyone else to choose words carefully. Stumbling was a bad stumble on my part. But I do want to divert for a second to something Durga said in our earlier discussions about Sutton and the context for his work, something about the Sutton mystique. And could you elaborate a little on that, please, Durga? Oh, the mystique I referred to was uh, just the fact that after his 1903 paper, there was nothing from him in the rest of his life that he published in this in this area, despite the fact that a lot of progress was being made in the laboratories of people uh, he had known. So that reminded me a little bit. I mean, I drew the comparison of, with the mystique of Didi Kosambi, the Indian geneticist, population geneticist, who had only one published paper in genetics on the mapping function. And so he really wasn't a geneticist. He was a mathematician. But he had great interest. He must undoubtedly have had great interest in the subject. And that didn't entice him to come, uh, write a commentary on further progress uh, in that work. Of course, even Kosambi died kind of early. So it's just that parallel between these two people who have both contributed in genetics and then, in a way, uh, dropped the mic. <laughs> 
you might say. So it, that parallel that caused me to call, use the word mystique. Thank you. I'd like to turn attention now back to your encounters and how did you first or rather when or where did you first encounter or learn about Sutton's work? And when did you first read the papers themselves? Well, I, I never did a history of biology course at university because, as you said in the introduction, I, I did the history of psychology instead. So I got Freud rather than Sutton. But I encountered his work initially as I became interested in the history of biology and in particular in the history of genetics and of DNA. And then you repeatedly saw references to these papers. But I'm going to admit something. The first time I've read them all the way through has been in preparation for this chat. So this isn't something that had been high on my high on my reading list. There are other things later on that I've been focusing on. But this, this is as new to me as it will be to some listeners. Great. Does anybody else in this panel have a similar confession? Well, it's not a confession. I can tell you exactly my introduction, and I think it's probably the majority. The students of biology had the same introduction because it was through the Biological Sciences and Curriculum Study textbook series. And this was an international, it came out of the 1960s and way into the 1970s. And what they did was to feature little vignettes at the side, portraits of you know, biologists, and you know, you've got portraits of people like like uh, Marshall Nuremberg, and and the famous image of Watson and Crick. But you know, I wasn't I wasn't a historian. I was I was a science geek, but I just loved reading up on these people. And I remember Sutton. I remember him explicitly because of that photograph of him with the white suit and the bow tie leaning against the tree and the fact that he was, you know, he has this name, Sutton, and he's U.S. based. That's what drew my attention, along with the importance of the work. So I think, you know, he's, he's always been, for me, in the pantheon. And I can tell you, I was 15. I've carried this with me since I was 15 years old, something like 50 years at this point. But I think that's where he's he's always there. And yet we don't know, as as Durga says, we've got this mystique because he almost vanishes. Right. He vanishes from view. And that's because he does a, this career change and he dies. He dies very, very early on. It would be interesting to think about, again, a counterfactual. What would have happened had he lived longer? Would he have returned to do cytology and so on? But in any case, that, that kind of answers your question. He's in the textbooks of biology. And how about the paper itself, Betty? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I read that paper through the Peters Collection, and I have my copy of the Peters Collection when I was actually in graduate school working at Cornell with Will Provine, who was a historian, a great historian of genetics. But I read that paper in that collection, and I still have my copy. It's dog-eared, but I refer to that that Peter's collection all the time, classic papers in genetics. And you know that there was, I was a science student, so there was a tradition of sitting around in a circle with other graduate students reading the classic papers. We read the classic papers in genetics, the classic papers in evolution, the classic papers in ecology. I did very particular and formal seminars as I was, you know, moving to become a historian from being a, what I thought I was going to be a paleobotanist at one point, but graduate school is the answer. And may I ask, just, just for our listeners to get a sense of when and, you know, the gap between reading and first learning about it, because you said you were 15. Yes. You don't need to name that year, but you were 15 and then you were in graduate school. Ten years time lag, because I was about 24, 25 when I read when I actually read the paper. And Durga, how about you? Well, like Matthew, I read the paper in detail only in preparation for this discussion, and I'm therefore very, very grateful to have been included in this discussion because looking back, it was the biggest takeaway for me to read the, this paper. But I've read about the paper in a perspectives article 
in genetics. So by Crow and Crow, I think it, that was about in 2003 to mark the 100 years or it could have been some other date. But genetics has these perspectives, uh, articles which are relatively short and to the point and uh, they tell the contemporary geneticists stories from their history that they should be aware of. And in a way, it's the kind of easy way to understand what went in the earlier papers without having to track them down for yourself. So I'm going to corner you a little bit here because you were, after all, somebody who's worked with chromosomes and even since the 80s. And it was 2002 before you read. 2002 is when the Crow paper was written. The Crow and Crow paper was written. But I want to, having had this experience, I want to ask whether you would now consider assigning these papers to your students who are primarily, I imagine, science students in general biology or genetics classes or to graduate students. And why or why not? So the short answer is no, I wouldn't assign these papers. That's because of a few reasons. One is uh, the gra grasshopper is not really uh, taken off as a genetic model system. And if one had to look at uh, earlier papers in cytogenetics, one would go back to the ones from the Drosophila literature, I think, the papers of Bridges and the work uh, on polypene chromosomes that culminated in a paper in which by micro dissection, they could get DNA from specific regions of the genome by micro dissecting particular bands of polydene chromosomes. So in a sense, one doesn't have to go back to the origins to describe the connection between DNA and chromosomes. It's more current and understandable for students to do so with more contemporary papers, including papers on genome sequencing. Having said that, there are a few students who like to know how it was before all of this DNA came about because, you know, it need not have been, as we talk about counterfactuals, that the chromosome has a single molecule of DNA stretching from one telomere to the other, right? Uh, it could have been multiple pieces of DNA joined in all kinds of various ways. But uh, no, it was a much simpler, conceptually simpler structure. So um, none of this comes through in certain paper. And besides, not too many pe people can uh, visualize a grasshopper. In fact, I made the mistake earlier on of confusing it for a locust myself. So it's, I think, also in undergraduate lab courses, people are shown uh, Drosophila and the salivary gland chromosomes of third instar larvae, and they know where to go and look if they need to look for chromosomes. Any responses to that? Well, I teach, I teach a, a first year course for biology students on the history of biology. And I have two lectures on sex, which goes from prehistory up to the double helix. So I'm, I've got to cram everything in. And Sutton gets a mention with Bovary because towards the end, I've got to explain uh, once people have worked out how that there was such a thing as heredity, which was remarkably difficult. And then with the rediscovery of Mendel's laws, this very rapid focus on chromosomes. So they, the Sutton Bovary hypothesis gets a quick one line mention it in a slide. However, I think this year I will put up the second paper for these students to read, not as an obligation, because I, I think that would be too onerous, but more for the perhaps one student out of 100 or so who are doing it, who might be interested and want to know and I think the reason for that is, is, is a bit what Durga's just indicated, that for many students, and for, for all of us, the more the technical detail is unfamiliar, the more difficult it is to perceive the ultimate significance and the breadth, which is why in the Watson and Crick paper, we all cling on to the, the one sentence we do understand, because the X-ray crystallography is just too bizarre. So I think the second paper, and Betty highlighted this, is really quite remarkable in this very, very general way that he's approaching and thinking. He's clearly been thinking really hard. I mean, I'm, I'd like to know how much he did this himself and how much it was in uh, interactions with, with Wilson. But I think this is, you know, this is a really interesting paper for students to start thinking about how you can understand something without under knowing everything about it when you've just got the beginnings of knowledge. And of course, that's the really interesting thing about science it's not 
it's not the, the, the stuff you know, it's how you find out the next thing. And you can see, you can sense that this is really a program in a way. It's a research program for future work. These are hypotheses that can be investigated. And I think that's really quite, in, that should, I hope, inspire maybe one, maybe two, to think a bit harder about this. Betty? Well, I think it would be very hard for me to use the two papers by Sutton unless it were an advanced undergraduate or a, a graduate course in the history of genetics. But, you know, I think what's happened to me as I've been examining the two papers is that I think the real value of those papers is to the young historian, philosopher, sociologist of science because of the way that they work together. I would use this as an example of how, you know, how, how science gets done, how it works. And I might actually pair them with the Watson and Crick papers because of the, the echoes. I'm not going to, again, we don't want to draw causal links, but there are echoes because there's a way. We, you know, scientists read history. They use history in all kinds of ways. And they're not necessarily aware of the historiography the way that we do, the professional historian of science. But I think, I don't think it's accidental that there's these echoes. They're, they're, they're interested in these crucial questions. I see the same thing with a lot of people who do integrative biology, what's called integrative biology today. I look at them and I go, well, you just sound like Conrad Waddington from the 1950s, and yet they're separated by something like 50 years. It's not a causal link. It's that there are persistent concerns and questions that are asked in biology, and they get answered periodically in different ways, but never really completely. So as new methods and techniques come in, there's these, you know, we find these parallels. And I prefer to think of echoes because the questions, the really big questions are, you know, continue to be asked, if that makes sense. So I would, you know, the answer to the question is I would use it in a graduate level history of science seminar, but both papers. Okay, that's a really insightful remark. And it's also insightful to see why, even though you're grateful that you're, you've been, you've had cause to read this paper, you might tell your students that they should do the same one day rather than do it right now as a student, which I find really interesting and really illuminating. I'd like to actually turn to Matthew now, who had a question for the other two of you, since we do have a little bit of time. Well, it refers to what I was saying earlier on and the, the quote I read out from the, the second paper. That is, today, we are all um, bewitched and convinced of the, the chemical nature of the gene. We know this is absolutely fundamental. And our whole understanding of how that was the final structure of the gene or of DNA was, di was, was discovered by Watson and Crick using data from Franklin and from Wilkins. That whole view is now kind of fixed, partly because of the role of Jim Watson's The Double Helix, which is kind of this, this thing, that this cultural object that sits on in our minds and shapes everything. It's very difficult to escape from. But if you go back 50 years before that discovery to the 1903 paper by Sutton, you can see him trying to grapple and wonder about the chemical nature or the material nature of the gene, which was not apparent at all. Because, of course, for Mendel, these were these factors that he could see apparently affecting patterns of hybridization, but he had no idea what they were. Darwin's hypotheses about gemmules in the blood were, were material, but he had no no real conception that they were of what they were, and they certainly weren't genes. And even later on, Thomas Hunt Morgan was still uncertain, I think in his Nobel Prize winning speech of 1933, is, is the gene a thing? Is it a material thing, he asks, or is it the amount of something? That rather than being having this uh, this relationship between a gene and a particular function and character, rather there's the amount of some thing, substance, energy, whatever that alters the physiology of the cell. So I, I wondered 
what the implications of of this work are. He's highlighted that he's highlighted Bateson's, Bateson's hypothesis about nuclear proteins, and yet it's going to be decades before anybody kind of takes that seriously and really tries to see what that might be. Uh, and is it simply, well, it turns out as, sorry, this is going to be a spoiler, Nerja. Uh, is it going to be that DNA turns out to be apparently simple and therefore everybody focuses on proteins and proteins are complicated, so we can't know? Or is there something else going on? What What stops people from understanding things in the past that now appear to us to be so evident. I think that's the always the, the challenge for historians, and in particular for students reading material, is to think, well, why didn't they get it? And often, of course, they, they think that people are stupid or whatever, or they had funny ideas, which doesn't really help you very much, because none of these people, and certainly not Sutton, <laughs> are stupid in any way, shape or form. They're incredibly smart. So what is it that they can't see that to us looks so evident in terms of the chemical nature of the genetic material. Betty, if you could take that challenge, because, you know, you talked already about how Sutton did not stumble into anything. He thought very long and hard. And as a historian, it's your perspective on this. Could you just backtrack a little bit to what you mean by this? Which aspect you would like me to respond to? All of it. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure that I can respond to to to, to all of uh, one a bit. The last, what what didn't people get? What were the implications of what he found here? How did it lead on to the discovery fifty years later of the the structure of the gene? I guess. Would you even have? Would you even have that sentence that you know suggesting a mechanism for replication? Right. Replication right there. That is Sutton because he's the one who who can see meiosis and he realizes he's looking at the behavior of chromosomes, the way in which they're moving around and replicating. And, and that that's what I mean by the rubber hits the road. You wouldn't have that 1953 paper in the way that it's formulated. I mean, I'm sure somebody, you know, Bovary or somebody else would have would have written something along the lines of what Sutton wrote. But but the influence, if you want to get at the influence, it's huge. It's enormous. Okay. Is that good enough, Matthew? It'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> Any last words to add? Well, there's there's at least two things that, you know, I want to finish up with myself. First of all, if I had the time, I would be working on a small biography called The Man in the White Suit <laughs> because it would be a biography of Sutton. And the more I delve into his background, the more interesting and intriguing, you know, this, this mystique about him. But, you know, he's got this very tragic life, but it's nonetheless filled with all of these astonishing, pretty remarkable achievements. So we need a biography of Sutton. And then the second thing that I think is really important to the practitioner and definitely the student of genetics or biology, and you know, we just have done nothing about this in the history of science. And, and I can tell you it matters to me because it's something that I could not do as a scientist. And that is the word technique. And, you know, when, when graduate students are being trained, especially in laboratory methods, they hear all about this thing called technique. And I can remember people sitting next to me who had it because they would come in really late. They, you know, they might be drunk or partying and they would put some slide together, something in microscopy especially, and they would produce a perfect slide. And I would be there all night long, I mean, you know, especially in my electron microscopy. And I had to really, really work at getting something that was average, let's say an average preparation or an average image. And we forget the importance of skill and that technique, the ineffable, right? The, it's a kind of a mysterious quality. That's how people talk about it in laboratory settings. And maybe you can add on to this. Durga and Matthew, 
whatever that technique is, we forget about how hard it is to isolate these chromosomes, to do the preparations. We just don't, we don't talk about it as much as we should. And that is part of the labor. And this, again, this ineffable, I don't know what to call it. So-and-so has this magical <laughs> skill called the technique that I never seem to have. So I think we need to appreciate what Sutton reminds us of the importance of that skill set and the fact that, you know, this is very visual art. There's another project that one could have in, as far as drawing and depicting and illustrating the chromosomes and the behavior of chromosomes. How do you know if they're doubling or if they're splitting? I mean, you don't, you, you don't know what's going on. So I think that's yet another part of the history of the, you know, the, the backdrop, the context to what Sutton is doing. So um, I just want to end with that, unless M Matthew and Durga want to say something about the importance of technique, especially in this part of the history of genetics. Just to jump in for a second, if I may, I just wanted to make a quick clarification, especially for our younger listeners for whom slides generally mean something in a PowerPoint. When Betty was referring to slides, she was referring to glass slides that one looks at under a microscope. And preparing them is much more difficult than throwing together images and putting out a PowerPoint slide. I mean, do you remember how hard it was to get those air bubbles out to drop the cover slip at just the right angle so that you would be able to squish and to create these chromosome squashes? What, you know, and, and we had, when I was doing it, I had the advantage of training. These guys, people like Sutton, didn't have much ahead of them. They were inventing it as they went along. I think that's the really significant thing here, that this is pioneering work. And so he didn't know what to expect. I mean, students learn that it's very difficult to see things down a microscope and then even more difficult to draw them. And they know what they're supposed to be seeing because there'll be a picture in the textbook or the demonstrators will have be projecting an image of saying, well, this is what you should be seeing. But Sutton and then later on Thomas Hunt Morgan's lab did not know, of course, what it was that they were looking at necessarily and certainly didn't know what it should in inverted commas, look like. So Sutton is, gets so many gold stars in his pantheon here, I think, for his work because he's he's this is the, the the pioneering work that is laying out not only a field bringing together cytology and heredity, but is also, as I said earlier on, in his writing, then laying out a research program, which we're still working through today. And I think that that is really, really significant. And the, the, the technique that Betty's is described, and we, all scientists working in different fields know that there are some people who've got it yeah. and others like like me me or Betty who don't have it. In my field, it'd be electrophysiology where you're recording from the electrical activity of a single cell. And I just do not have the hands that you need to be able to do that. The French have a lovely word for it, gestuelle, the way that you actually have to manipulate whatever it is, whether it's a microscope slide or an electrode or doing a PCR. Loads of students these days have quickly learned that PCR is magic because you never know whether it's going to work or not. And so they all have superstitions about what order they've got to do things and how they get the pipettes out because they, they don't know why it's not working. So they then latch on to any kind of nonsense in the hope that it will come good. But imagine you're pioneering that. Imagine you're the first person to do that. You don't know what you're supposed to see down this microscope. You don't know how to represent it. And yet Sutton gets it absolutely right. Well, I think your talk of pioneers is a very apt place to end things because pioneers are often associated with the Midwest, which is where Sutton came from. And so on that pioneering note, I think I shall conclude today's episode. Thank you all so much for joining us, Betty, Matthew, and Durga. And I shall also thank everybody in the audience. Stay tuned. We shall be back with more episodes, again, from farther afield than chemistry in the next month. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.